said it again it was all it was recorded being replayed <laughs> <laughs> it is only to actually bring up the point yeah. yes it has been reiterated to bring home the point effectively i think you're being recorded <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> so be very careful what you say yes and let's go back to the smaller screen Oh wait a minute! No, wrong one. Whoops! What have I done? One thing I I still feel amazed, and I mentioned to many Martin, your uh, faculty to read page by page rather than word by word as we do. And uh, I could actually test that when you read a thesis of a student in Ahmedabad overnight, and you could answer questions of which what thing appeared on what page. Without any difficulty, I bumped into Hema um, in Dublin. Yes, she's the student you're referring to, and of yes. course she was, she was also in Delhi at the Jamoff conference. Yes, um, she's done some very very good work, indeed. And yes. the reason I could skim read her PhD thesis, of course, was that I'd been to all those sites. I'd logged those sections myself. I knew exactly what she was talking about. So I think our president has arrived. Uh, ma'am, your your mic is uh, on mute. Good so. morning, everybody, and I'm very happy. I uh, welcome Martin Williams for today's talk. and we are looking forward for your for your talk and many many people are interested in the the uh, topic you are going to talk about and uh, would be would be very much interested and there are uh, about uh, many people who are working on uh, quaternary paleoclimate and um, on the, they are interested in uh, knowing about the green sahara and uh, and what are what are the changes took place during that time So thank you so much, uh, Martin, uh, for agreeing to give your talk today. Thank you so much. A Martin, great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Padma Prasad is uh, the president of uh, Association of Continental Researchers, and she is also the director of uh, our institute, Virbhasan Institute of Indian Sciences. So in spite of her busy, you know, she was in, in a meeting, so um, she's here to listen to you. Thank and, you. I'm I'm honoured, and it's an enormous pleasure. Um, <laughs> in fact, I've had eight working trips to India. Wow. Since since 1980, January, February, March 1980, Ooh. my first visit to the Son Valley and the Belan, uh -huh. um, also up in the lower Himalayas, the Himalayan foothills, and in Rajasthan, the Toba Ash, etc. So you're probably wondering why I'm not talking about India, and I yeah. thought I'd take you a little bit out of your comfort zone because. <laughs> In the Sahara, which I first visited in the northern summer of 1962, um, when the shade temperatures were fluctuating between about 45 and 50 degrees Celsius, so it was madness to go down to the central Sahara in the middle of summer. But we did, and what immediately struck me then was the abundant evidence of a former human presence. In the, not only the rock art, which I'll show you shortly, but also the fossils, and indeed, the um, great deal of paleoclimatic evidence. 
So I immediately, way back in 1962, asked myself, why was the Sahara once able to support human life as well as great herds of savanna animals, elephants, hippos, and so on, and fish? Um, why did it cease being able to do this? Did humans have a role? And could it become green once again? So I'll now take you on a short journey, 35 minutes, to cross the Sahara where we look at the different forms of evidence. And I'll wrap up by asking, trying to answer the key questions I've just asked. Yeah. I might also add that I'm pitching the talk at the sort of level that my own students would follow. And there are only three slides of any complexity, as I promised before. So I'll now move straight into the talk. Yeah, uh, Martin, just a second. Um, I'll just uh, introduce you to the audience and, uh, you know, everybody who's linked here. So um, we, we just start um, now and uh, uh, f just a few words about the association first. Good morning, everybody, linked here on this virtual platform. And I'm Benita Fartial, uh, the secretary of uh, EOQR, and uh, I will and our, all our members, office bearers and members. The Association of Quaternary Researchers is a recently established associ association. It was established in December 2019 and it's committed towards the overall ascent of researchers in the Indian continent in general and India in particular. Yeah. So, Losing the sound. Yeah, it's Benita. There's some issue with us. Your your voice is not coming. Oh, my voice isn't coming. coming. No, no, Benita. Okay. Can you hear it now? Yeah, you can come. Um, seeks to organize regular meetings, national and international uh, conferences, field workshops, laboratory training sessions, brainstorm. Again, there is some disconnection. Mm. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, Can you hear me? Milita, use your uh, mobile. Martin, we can hear you very clearly. We cannot hear Benita. Uh, so. um, can you see my first slide? Can you see we can't slide? see your slide. Your slide is not on. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go back. Now, my slide wasn't on, so I'll go back here. What What do I need to click? Present now. Present now. Yeah. They will be on the Present now. At uh, extreme your line. Present line. now. Okay. okay. And your yeah. entire screen. Shall I click your entire screen? Yes, yes. Then and then allow. Allow. And then go straight that's into the click. That window system. Okay. Yes. Can you yeah, see we that? Have yeah, it is appearing now. It's appearing now. Okay, can I start now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you see that? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, yes. Is that clear? And am I audible? Yes. You are, you are absolutely clear. Your, your voice is clear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You can see that? Yeah, we are hearing to you, listening to you. And you can see the screen. That's good. Lovely. Okay. Now, one of the things I'm going to do in this talk <laughs> is to take you on a journey to a place called Adrabus, which is a ring complex in the heart of the Sahara, over 1,500 kilometers from the nearest bit of coast. The Sahara itself is over 3,000 kilometers from east to west, and nearly 2,000 kilometers from north to south. So it's a very large very desert. Large. Okay, so first I'll introduce you 
to the Sahara today. Then I will talk about the birth of the desert. And then I'll ask why there have been alternating wet and dry climates. And then I'll give the main focus, which is the evidence of a recently wetter past, the hippo hunters and cattle herders of the Sahara. And finally, I will talk about the desiccation and the exodus of people and ask humans or climate. So that's the menu. Now, when we think of the Sahara, we immediately think of dunes, great sand dunes. Those sand dunes are about 100 meters high. But in fact, less than a fifth of the Sahara is actually covered in sand. And what it consists of, the sand itself comes from prolonged erosion over millions of years of older rocks particularly the sandstones that today cover about 70% of the entire Sahara. Most of the Sahara consists of rugged mountains, vast sandstone plateaus, great tracts of gravel plains like this one in southern Algeria, um, volcanic mountains, this is a plug in the Hogar Mountains of the central Sahara, and this environment has always attracted holy men. Uh, Father Charles de Foucault had been a French cavalry officer. And then, early last century, he became a hermit. He was revered by the local Touareg people. And this is his hermitage, which still exists today. Very high up, with a wonderful view across the Hogar Mountains, which are all volcanic. He was killed in 1916. And from time to time, even today, even in the heart of the Sahara, there are sudden intense rainstorms. This is one I experienced in the Mauritanian desert in the Western Sahara in 2004. And it helps these rainstorms have operated intermittently for the past several million years and they've helped to replenish the regional groundwater supplies. Some of these hidden uh, oases like El Berbera in the Mauritanian desert, you don't see until you're practically on top of them, walking across the sandstone plateaus and you suddenly come to a great cliff and there is a waterfall and a pool of fresh water. And that has enabled present day life to continue. Now, the Sahara itself probably originated about 7 million years ago as a desert. And this was a time of prolonged and widespread global cooling. And since that time, the climate has alternated between wet and dry. I'm standing um, where that photograph was taken at about 1,500 meters. Those dunes are about 120 meters high, and the mountain in the distance is about 80 kilometers away. Very, very clear um, atmosphere. Northward movement of the African tectonic plate, which I'll show you in a moment, brought North Africa into dry tropical latitudes. And in addition, the great Tethys Sea which was ancestral to the present Mediterranean, in a sense, shrank. And so North Africa was deprived of a major source of moisture. And as the surrounding oceans also became cooler, there was less evaporation and therefore less moisture available to bring rain to the Sahara. Now, 420 million years ago, India... Antarctica, Australia, and what we now call Africa, these stable cratonic areas, and South America were part of a supercontinent called Gondwana. And you can see 
that Gondwana was located at that time well south of the equator. Moving on a few hundred million years, in fact to 60 million years ago, by now Gondwana had separated, the mid-ocean ridges were forming and widening, and Africa was the African tectonic plate, including Saudi Arabia, was moving northwards at about um, four to five centimeters a year. But you can see that at that time, what is now the central Sahara was crossed by the equator. And from then onwards, it was and it became progressively drier, but equatorial rainforests persisted in what is now the Sahara until about 20 to 15 million years ago. What's also interesting is that about 100 million years and earlier, the whole of what is now the Sahara was the stamping ground for many species of dinosaurs. Some of these were carnivores, some were herbivores, some were fish eaters, and their remains are abundant right across the Sahara today. So we can say that the Sahara is dry because it drifted into latitudes, which today are under the control of dry subsiding air. As air subsides, it becomes compressed, and if you imagine pumping up a bicycle wheel, it becomes warmer, it can absorb more moisture vapor, it acts as a gigantic desiccator. And it's also located well away from the influence of moist air masses. So it's dry for very sound geographical reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with any human impact. I can't stress that too much. Some learned professors, um, I will give no names, have argued Sahara was caused by human overgrazing. Well, it was there as a desert well before humans appeared on the scene. During the Eocene and Miocene, a series of tectonic movements occurred across North Africa, creating a series of uplands like the Hogar, the Tibesti, Jebel Uenat, which I'll show you in a moment, show you the rock art, and Jebel Mara. The Jebel Mara is a great volcano, Tibesti is a volcano, the Hogar you've seen, that's volcanic, and then these depressions like the Chad Depression and a whole series of other depressions. And at that time, huge rivers were flowing across the desert, carrying a load of sand and gravel to the sea, to, mainly to the north, but some of them to the south. And the sand was later, during drier phases, from about 7 million onwards, reworked by wind as the trade winds became stronger and formed into the desert dunes that we know today. For example, um, going back to what I said earlier, one of the puzzles of the Saharan geology is why do you have volcanoes like Jebel Mara, which has been active as recently as 5,000 years ago, when there was a huge eruption? Why do, they, why do they occur in the middle of a tectonically stable landmass? Well, part of the reason is that they occur at the intersection of a series of lineaments or zones of crustal weakness, one of them running across the Sahara from the southwest to the northeast, and the other running across the Sahara from the southeast up to the northwest. And at the intersection, we have recurrent volcanic activity. These lineaments incidentally control the pattern of the Nile and go back to Precambrian times, to lower Proterozoic times, when they were periodically reactivated ever since. Now, why do we have these alternating wet and dry cycles that are evident in the geomorphological and the paleoecological and the 
stratigraphic and sedimentological record of sediments in the Sahara. Well, the primary control is changes in the tilt of the Earth's axis and in the shape of the elliptical path of the Earth around the Sun, which controls the amount of solar radiation received by the Earth at different latitudes. So putting it simply, when the tropics receive more solar radiation, the wet season lasts longer, the rainstorms are more intense, and summer rains push further into the Sahara. And conversely, when there's less solar radiation, the tropics are cooler, the wet season is shorter, fewer rainstorms, and less penetration of rain into the desert. And the three key cycles, the long-term ones, are the orbital eccentricity cycle, 100,000 years, the changing tilt of the Earth's axis, 40,000 years, and the season of the year in which the Earth is closest to the Sun, which on average is about 20,000 years. It, it actually varies between about 16 and 23,000. But let's keep it simple. So now let's look at the evidence of a recently wetter past between about 14,500 years ago and 5,000 years ago across what's currently the arid Sahara. Now, I don't want to imply that it was persistently wet throughout that time. It wasn't. There were short, sharp inter intervals of up to a thousand years and more when it was significantly drier. But most of the time, it was indeed wetter. And here is some of the evidence. In the Eastern Sahara, you find abundant remains of former lake beds composed of diatomite, um, some of the siliceous frustules of diatoms, a type of algae. And they've been wind eroded since then and are standing proud. Those were old lake beds. Equally and dramatically, again in the Eastern Sahara, about a couple of hundred kilometers to the west of the present Nile, you find fossil remains of two meter long Nile perch. And this is the jaw and some of the vertebrae. And this uh, fish, about 9,000 years old, again indicating significantly wetter conditions, streams flowing where today there are no streams at all. Now this is the second complicated diagram. It simply shows that the intertropical convergence zone, which brings moisture from the equator to the tropics, that's the present day boundary in the wet season, present day boundary in the dry season. The details don't matter, but during the wetter intervals, it extended further north, and during the drier intervals, it never reached as far as it does today. So that's one of the controls over the amount of rain in the Sahara. Another bit of evidence, a river terrace exposed in the flank of a desert dune. In fact, there are two terraces. There's a lower one here, which has Neolithic remains on it, dating to about five, 6,000. And on the surface of this uh, terrace, which is an old floodplain, you have Epipaleolithic remains dating back to about um, 15 to 20,000. Now, what's interesting is that the sediments are very finely laminated silts and clays, whereas today, on the rare occasions that this river flows, it, it carries sand and gravel. So very different sediments, and of course, the dominant feature is the sand dune. So aridity today. Now, at the present time, the southern limit of active dunes coincides very broadly with the 150 millimeter isohyet. And we find fixed dunes well south of that present limit. So these are the fixed dunes, the dashed line. 
and they indic and they coincide in places with the thousand millimeter isohyate of today, indicating that in the past the southern margin of the Sahara extended about 800 kilometers further south into areas that today receive a meter of rain a year. So that's one of the dry intervals. Now, Jebel Uenat, I mentioned, it's that huge mountain in the southeastern Libyan desert. And the rocks inside the ring complex and the granite core of the ring complex are covered in these beautiful paintings of domesticated cattle and the cattle herders, and this chap has a bow and arrow. You also see dogs, and you see little domestic scenes, you see the cattle camps, and these have been dated back to between about seven and a half thousand and five and a half thousand, based on the archaeology. What I found interesting is in southern Algeria, you see paintings, very lifelike, of women with he rather fine headdresses riding oxen. And that's very interesting because in Western Sudan today, the Bagara people, the Bagara comes from the Arabic word for cow, migrate north during the rainy season in search of fresh pasture. And the women and the babies travel on the back of oxen. So here we have a tradition that still exists today that goes back five, six, seven thousand years. So the tropics were warmer and wetter between roughly 15,000 and 5,000 years ago, although there were at least three significantly drier intervals in that time. The Sahara was then covered in savanna, woodland, and grassland until the tropics became cooler. And the once green Sahara, or some might say pale green Sahara, reverted once more to desert. So, what's going on? And what was the role of humans? But first, some more of the rock art. This is from the southern Libyan desert, a couple of these mythical figures, boxing. They don't resemble any animal that I know, apart from my cats, but they don't fight like that. And here you have a local Libyan tribesman and an engraved giraffe. Again, these date back to this wetter interval. A rather nice engraved elephant. On one um, paint uh, engraving, you could see a lioness um, jumping on an elephant. Here you see a, a human figure with a throwing stick of some sort, and a couple of antelopes. Again, all this is in the hyper arid southern Sahara. And today it rains about um, once every 20 years on average. So very, very dry. Now I'll take you back, I'll take you on a journey to Adrabus, where I worked for three months in 1970. And it's located, as I said earlier, 1500 kilometers from the nearest bit of coast. So en route, across the desert to Adrabus with our Touareg guide, uh, Zoe Binweni, and our camels. That is the Bus. It's a ring complex, a granite core, a volcanic periphery, fans coming from the uplands but now dry, and former lake beds. On the way to the Adrabus, Professor Desmond Clark spotted a bit of broken pot and he dug out his trowel and brush and excavated, watched by Zoe, who thought he was looking for gold, with a rather supercilious camel keeping 
watch. And what emerged was, in fact, two pots. The upper pot was a cover for the lower pot, which was filled with Siltus integrifolia, fruit, dried fruit. Now, the tree Siltus integrifolia needs at least 450, mil uh, 450 millimeters of rain a year to survive. Today, we're in an area of 100 millimeters, if you're lucky. And the pot is about 5,000 years old. Scattered around were some land snails, Limicularia flammata, which is an, an acacia tall grass savanna uh, land snail. Uh, again, today it lives in a savanna environment with 450 to 550 millimeters of rain a year. So we were seeing evidence of a wetter past. On the first day at Adrabus, Desmond Clark and I went ahead as the advance guard, the others came later. We spotted a tiny bit of white bone-like material protruding from the surface of this dark gray clay. It turned out that it was the tip of a horn core. And when excavated, which I did with dental picks and brush, took me 14 days, what came out was the oldest complete Neolithic cow ever found in the Sahara, and that remains true today. Fragments had been found before, but no complete skeleton. And another view of the what's Bos Brachyceros, which is the short-horned domestic cow. The um, evidence at Adrabus went back from the Neolithic back to the early Stone Age. This rather beautiful hand axe is about half a million years old, and we found hundreds of them. The assemblage from Adrabus surface finds, these are Neolithic arrowheads, there are spear points, there's a rather nice knife made from silicified vitric tuff, a grindstone, and an adze, favorite uh, tool of nilotic carpenters uh, today, and a number of other um, cutting implements. So a very rich um, evidence going back at least half a million years. And also, we can compare this, that this is the third and last complicated diagram, rather a dated one from Desmond Clark. Um, what you see are these barbed bone points, like this, these in the Nile Valley today, in Neolithic sites. We find these right across the lake sites in the Sahara. And in one site on the very last day at Adrabus, Desmond and I found exposed in the lake silts a rib cage, which turned out, back, turned out to be the rib cage of a hippopotamus, and embedded in it was a barbed bone harpoon point. We left it there. We didn't excavate it. But the hippos were part of the diet of the Neolithic people and the late Stone Age people. And, of course, um, Nile perch. Now, from about four and a half thousand years onwards, the northern tropics received less solar radiation and the summer monsoon became weaker. The previously more humid desert regions of India and China also dried out at the same time as the Sahara. The desiccation, incidentally, was not synchronous. It was time transgressive. The southernmost part, portions of the Sahara remained wet for longer than the central portions. And the drier climate was a result of changes in solar radiation and not caused by humans. Whoops. 
go back. Oops, sorry. There we go. No doubt. Um, Just sorry, I move on. Got a bit carried away there. So the the question, the desiccation of the Sahara and the exodus of the people, was it humans or climate? There have been recurrent claims that humans created the desert. Well, I've argued that the desert goes back at least seven million years and there have been alternating wet and dry phases linked to astronomical factors nothing to do with humans this picture from southern uh, algeria of horse and chariot it's about two and a half two thousand years old the horse was introduced into egypt by the hyksos um, in a rather notorious book called Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken. He commented on these figures, which I'm showing you now, these plumed warriors and little horses. And he said, these were creatures from outer space. They, these were their antennae and all the marvels of the world today, nothing to do with humans or prehistoric humans who he said were far too stupid. It was all due to a visit from outer space. Well, he spent time in jail for fraud, and I can assure you that these engravings are engravings of people wearing ostrich plumes, and these are the little horses that were pulling the chariots 2,000 years ago. So that brings me to the end, and I'm now happy to take questions. Thank you, Martin. Uh, My pleasure. <laughs> Shall I press stop presenting? Yeah, you can stop presenting. So, okay. Um, I think anybody would like to interact with Martin, please unmute yourself and then have a Martin, Martin, it is a very fascinating talk. Can you hear me? I can indeed, uh, Ashok. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the age of seven million years. How did you get that seven million years? The seven million? Yeah, how did you get that number? Um, that was based on oceanographic work published in Nature um, by a group of marine geologists who found evidence of major cooling, which they then related to the arrival of dust offshore, and a group of German marine geologists led by Michael Sandheim um, dated the, uh, ev the phases of dust coming from the Sahara into the Atlantic. So it's based on a combination of evidence, primarily marine geology, marine sediment cores. Does that answer your question? I think Parth, Parth, you want to say something? Okay, Parth, far away. Uh, yes, I had a question. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Martin. Um, my question was basically, uh, is there a possibility of, I mean, if, even if humans didn't have a major impact on the, on the uh, formation of the desert, do you think that there would have been pockets, for example, isolated oases, where they were settling uh, for a long time and accelerating the process in different locations? if not being a major factor, 
maybe being a regional uh, smaller factor? Yes, a very good question. Um, one of the problems today is major irrigation projects in places like the Eastern Sahara and Karga Jadid and so on, where water is being piped through pipes that are about half a meter diameter just for irrigation. And that is tapping groundwater that was last replenished between 40,000 and 25,000 years ago. So there's a real danger that we're mining a resource that's no longer available. And that's leading to a drop in the water table, which is leading to drying out of oases. On a smaller scale, of course, if people overuse a resource, then they um, move on or migrate. So when, when the Sahara dried out, people had three options to adapt, to migrate, or to become extinct. And they did all three. So another thing is we talk about desertification and we talk about overgrazing along the southern margins of the Sahara. That is undoubtedly true. And what I think is more significant is the change in government policies, particularly, well, I'll give an example, Sudan, the traditional owners, the nomads and cultivators, lived in symbiotic relationship and got on well. Any disputes were resolved by the tribal chiefs. When the central government removed power from the tribal chiefs, disputes arose, magnified, and became a major civil war in, in Darfur, in Western Sudan. So some of the desertification that's undoubtedly occurring in different parts of North Africa is actually caused by political and social factors rather than purely climatic factors. So, okay. Okay, thank you. I think there are some questions in the chat box. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'll have a look. I'll read it now, uh, Marty. It is from the YouTube first. It is Priyatan Gupta. Good afternoon, sir. My question is: there uh, is there any relationship between relation between closing of the Indonesian gateway and uh, progressive eridification of Africa to or from Sahara Desert? The, the closing of the Tethian Sea, did you say? Uh, in Indonesian Gateway. Ah, yes, yes. And then yeah, he again, a very intelligent question, and that led to increased aridity in East Africa. But it had less of an impact on the Sahara as such. It was a factor in arid, uh, aridity over... Northeast Africa, the the uplands of Ethiopia and Kenya, undoubtedly. Okay. And uh, he further writes that uh, well, uh, did this progressive eridification evolve bipedal human um, ancestor? Was this responsible for the bipedal uh, ancestor? Early humans. I'm yeah. Talking about. There were so few and their impact was so minimal hmm. that it had no impact at all, negligible. Okay. Thank you. And, and, uh, there is one question from Rajesh. Rajesh, can you uh, just unmute yourself and ask? You are here. Hi. Uh, Professor Williams, excellent talk. Oh. And I have a quick question yes. uh, regarding the speculation, you can say, with the ongoing anthropogenic climate warming, do you think that Sahara kind of desert can become greener again? Because there are talks about even Thar desert, they can become greener because of the shifts of the monsoonal belts. What, what is your opinion on that? Excellent question, Rajesh. Um, Karl Butzer argued that the early Holocene Sahara was an analog for a globally warmer Sahara. And Nicole Putimer also made the same argument. I don't believe either of them 
Um, I think what um, what is actually happening today in places like northern Sudan is the temperatures are increasing, the rainfall is less, evaporation is greater, and things are becoming drier. And I think it's Yes, the Sahara will become green again, but not for another 20,000 years. Oh. It, won't, it, won't, it won't be in my lifetime or your lifetime. <laughs> I wish I could say otherwise, but yeah. I can't, I won't. So I think it's extremely, I, I think certain areas will undoubtedly benefit from more <laughs> tropical evaporation from the ocean and and that will have the downside of huge cyclones and, and um, floods but uh, the sahara is so big and so far inland that you really need a major change in the strength of the summer monsoon far yeah. beyond um, anything that humans can do at the present time that's my view but i may well be wrong and I hope I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin, I just had a query that uh, the, the petroglyphs or the rock art that you had shown, beautiful rock art in the Saharan, uh, you know, humanity, uh, whatever, these rocks. So uh, how, how do you date these uh, petroglyphs and say it was like 5,000 years old or older? What is the, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. technical date? Yeah. I was hoping you would ask that question. <laughs> I don't know and if you, if you didn't, I would ask it myself and try and answer it. <laughs> so, um, there are two ways of doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Traditionally, what's been done by archaeologists in rock shelters, as Path well knows, is mm -hmm. fragments have fallen from the cave rock shelter. Mm -hmm. And they become buried in the archaeological sediment, mm. which then is dated independently either by radiocarbon dating of charcoal or by luminescence dating of sand grains. And that's an indirect way of obtaining a date, but it's very indirect. Another way of doing it, which has also been applied quite recently mm. in uh, Sulawesi, in fact, is to date the using uranium series dating, the calcite patina that overlies the art itself sometimes in some places. A third way is to look for microscopic remains of carbon in the pigment and use accelerator mass spectrometry. Um, that has been tried and it's been tried by, dare I say it, at least one complete charlatan um, it's it's a possibility. Um, there are other methods available, um, trying to date the varnish itself, yeah. and it's 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 an, a hot topic how to date the art. Yeah, um, but if you see, I'm sorry to continue. If you see, for example, an elephant depicted, mm -hmm. and you're lucky enough to find elephant remains nearby or in the shelter yeah. and you can date those that gives you an indirect idea yeah. but it, it's very difficult and a lot of it is argument by analogy we know from wnat because mm -hmm. there's been excavations there and the pottery of different um, generations has itself also given us good stratigraphy radiocarbon dates and we'd be able to marry the ages of that and associated fauna with the rock art yeah, yeah. but it's still pretty tricky yeah because uh, martin uh, in ladakh also it's a high altitude cold desert so there we do find many petroglyphs and we feel that they are of different uh, ages uh, because some the varnish the desert varnish in, in some is like very very shiny thick dark uh, black but in some, it feels that, uh, you know, the recent people have just gone there and done, uh, 
structures like uh, you know drawn them themselves so it's so hard to uh, say which one is the real old ones and which are the you know the ones that are done here so i was thinking how could we really date them but i feel like this uranium uh, calcium uh, series yes. it's that. trick it's tricky um, <laughs> but we we've date we dated the cow to about five and a half thousand the one i showed you yeah, so we know that there were cows in the Sahara five and a half thousand years ago. We know, in fact, that there are earlier fragments. So the um, rock paintings of cattle and cattle scenes could be that old. Or, with a huge stretch of the imagination, you could argue, and I won't, but you could, that people saw cattle a thousand kilometers further south migrated into the desert and painted from memory. Yeah. <laughs> and some people have argued oh. that. I, I won't. I won't. I won't. So I, I think you need a variety of approaches. You yeah. need good archaeology, good stratigraphy, yeah. first-class dating, yeah. and um, careful examination of the rock art itself. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more question from Nitesh Kumar Konde. Uh, Nitesh, are you there? You want to ask it yourself or we could read it out? Uh, okay. Uh, hello, sir. I want to ask regarding the formation of these deserts. So, uh, my first question is uh, uh, whether these uh, deserts, you correlated the formation of Sahara with Chinese and uh, Indian deserts. So, what are the evidences uh, uh, so that we can correlate the formation timing of these deserts. And second thing, uh, do you believe that Thar desert also form around the same time? Or <laughs> I just want to like your yeah. comments on Dare I answer a question like that with Ashok Singh be present? Mm -hmm. um, I'll have a go. I think very broadly, you could argue from the evidence in the Potwa Plateau in Pakistan that we have evidence of aridity going back to at least 7 million. In China, the latest uh, work that's just come out, um, which hasn't been published yet, indicates um, windblown sand well in excess of 6 million, probably a great deal older. So I don't expect that the onset of deserts is everywhere synchronous. But where you have um, global events like cooling of the world ocean, for which there's excellent evidence at um, back to seven, at seven million, then I think you'll see phases of aridity in places like the Tar Desert, in places like the Taklamakan, and also, of course, the Sahara. So, I think you have to look at each desert on its own merits and date them independently. I'm not sure if that answers your very good question, but it's the best I can do. Thank you, sir, for your comments. My pleasure. Uh, we have a question from uh, Debarati Nag. Uh, how this eridification of the Sahara has affected the global climate circulation? You mean how the past desertification? Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Yep, yep, okay. I'll just have a drink of Adelaide water. Yeah, sure. And uh, till that time, I would like to tell the audience that uh, Martin has written many, many books. And uh, this was from his uh, latest book, uh, Sahara was Green. And uh, this is the story of the desert written in, in for non-specialist readers. And I would suggest all of you to read it. And he's also written books uh, like Climate Change in Desert, Nile Waters and Saharan Sands, and Nile Basin. So, you know, these are uh, some of his reads and, um, which, in which he has co covered topics uh, and disciplines in geology, pedology, geomorphology, uh, landscape. So, yeah, so we have this legend here. So, I feel you should interact more and more with Martin. Yeah, Martin, you can answer, Deva, uh, how this identification of Sahara has affected the global climate circulation. Okay. 
With the cooling that led to expansion of ice in Antarctica, in the Miocene, the temperature gradient between equator and pole became steeper, and the pressure gradient became steeper. And as a consequence, what we call the trade winds also became stronger. And this in turn led to mobilization of alluvial sand and forming it eventually into desert dunes, dune fields, and sand plains. So the events much further afield repercussed and influenced what was actually happening in the Sahara. It, it could be argued that the creation of an enormous desert would create a type of heat sink with outgoing radiation and cooling of the surface in the winters. That takes us into arcane meteorology, which is well beyond my competence. So, yes, I suspect that as the desert, uh, as the Sahara evolved, it certainly would have had a global impact. What that impact is, is for you and others to discover. That's one of the challenges for you. I realize that's a cop out. I realize I haven't really answered that question, but um, it's a very it's a very complex issue. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, there is uh, when Sahara was forming dunes. What must have happened to the fine sediments? How far can you expect the lowest deposits uh, corresponding to Sahara? How far could they have travelled? Mr. Dr. Prabhupada Sukumaran has written this question. Today, desert dust from the central Sahara reaches as far as the Amazon. Oh, wow. And in fact, the nutrients in the desert dust help to fertilize the rainforest in the Amazon. So, rather paradoxically, the Amazon has benefited over the last seven million years from desert dust blown from North Africa, and still does today. In addition, <coughs> excuse me, the certain of the particles in the dust help um, water vapor to condense around a nucleus of the desert dust and form drops, which then lead to enhanced rainfall. So, if you like, um, one man's dust is another man's fertilizer, even though it's 4,000 kilometers away. And it's, um, it's extraordinary, really, to think that the Amazon benefits so much from the export of desert du dust from our greatest desert. But that's the case, and has long been the case. How far dust can be carried? Well, dust from Inner Mongolia um, reached Greenland, and reached Green Greenland um, 74,000 years ago and has been fingerprinted and dated very precisely, well, re reasonably accurately. Yeah. So that's, that's a long distance. Um, the, in Crete and Greece, you find footprints of early hominins, and they're embedded in dust, and that dust was blown from the Sahara. And lurse, or dust from the Sahara, was also regularly blown across the Atlantic to North Africa, I mean to North America, mm -hmm. and still is today, uh, across Barbados. So um, you're talking about very long distance transport, indeed. Okay. 
Okay, so Kumaran, I hope you've got uh, your answer. And uh, we'll take the last question. It's by Tichya N. Uh, she, uh, she writes, wonderful talk. Has the past uh, seasonal reversal of atmospheric flow over the Arabian Sea has fundamental effects on the climatology of South Asia? Sorry, repeat that again, please. Uh, has the past seasonal reversal of atmospheric flow over the Arabian Sea has fundamental effects on the climatology of South Asia? It's, it's in the chat box, uh, if you please. Uh, uh, N, uh, are you around? Yeah, no, I heard the question. Okay. I, thank you. No, no. Um, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. The, the Hello, sir. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, one more yes. thing that I wanted to ask that uh, Arabia and South Asia, especially India, just oceans away from us, why <laughs> they are so uh, different than us in terms of, not just in terms of climate now, the present climate, uh, in, in also in terms of uh, the geological wealth like fossil fuel and everything, if you can throw some light on that also. And uh, Vinita Ma'am answered, would you like me to uh, read my previous question again or, or it's clear? Uh, Martin, is the previous question clear? Well, you can repeat it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, why? why um, I think there are two fundamental sets of controls. One is tectonic and movement of tectonic plates. Because once you've moved into areas with dry subsiding air, then you move into arid latitudes. And that's linked to the Hadley circulation. So warm, warm air from the equator rises, moves north and south, sheds its water vapor in the form of rain, becomes colder, denser, subsides, warms up, and has a desiccating effect. So we know that um, the present latitude of Saudi Arabia, for example, and of India and um, Pakistan, North Africa, have changed as Gondwana split and the continents moved in different directions. So that's the first order control. Second order control are the three astronomical cycles, as I alluded to earlier, the 100,000 year cycle, which is the path of the Earth around the Sun, which sometimes is more elliptical, sometimes more circular, and gives about a 3% difference in solar radiation received in the upper atmosphere. The shorter term cycles, about 40,000, 20,000, likewise are very important because they control the seasonality. When the tilt of the Earth's axis is steeper, the, the climate of the Earth is more seasonal. When the tilt is less, the, the climate of the Earth is more equable. So, in times of steep tilt, every 20 or so thousand years, you had cold northern winters, build up of glacial ice, and mild summers, um, hot summers rather. Reduce the tilt and you get the opposite. So, those are the second order of uh, influences. Third order influences are things like feedback from um, changes in vegetation cover, changes in the surface um, roughness, changes in presence or absence of water bodies, and finally, of course, the greenhouse gases, the input periodically changing of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. So all of these are operating, at, and there are other smaller cycles. You know, it's like big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them. Um, so I didn't for night. So you, you've got a series of controlling factors which really have to be looked at. Uh, Martin, uh, Martin, you're still there? Did that answer you? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin? Yes, Ashok. Uh, what in your view would be, should be, or would be the focus of 
if you research in dry lands in the coming next decade what should be or could be the focus um, what kind of questions would need to be asked vis a vis the human impact and whatever sustainable yeah. development and whatever what should yeah. be the focus of future studies i think one of the key questions is how do different elements in the biosphere and the hydrosphere respond to changes in forcing factors and is the change synchronous or time transgressive um, because when we look at the end of the so-called african humid period four and a half thousand what we see is that the response was not synchronous it was time transgressive we also note that certain elements of the landscape are far more sensitive and respond far more rapidly to change than others so i th i think what we have to do is try and understand how the different elements in the biosphere Highest, uh, highest hydrosphere, hydrosphere and in the, and in the landscape, landscape in general, in general respond, respond I'm hearing echoes, echoes. <laughs> um, respond to respond changes in fossil fuels. And, and secondly, and secondly and equally, and equally, we have to learn, have that, to learn that, that humans human need to fulfill or obey or certain obey preconditions, preconditions for sustainable for use sustainable of dry land. Dry and I'll outline four key propositions. One, One we must not we remove from the desert ecosystems, ecosystems materials at a rate faster than they can be replenished. Soil erosion is a classic example. You can't mine you the can't soil. Mine Groundwater is another. Secondly, and the opposite of that, you sh we should not consistently add materials to the desert ecosystems at a rate faster than they can be absorbed and recycled. Here, I'm thinking of fertilizers, I'm thinking of various nutrients. So that's the second. The third is the third. fundamental and goes back to Einstein's, Einstein's um, relativity, relativity law, and that law. is that on this earth, the only source of a net increase in primary productivity comes from sunlight operating through plants via photosynthesis. Everything else is simply And fourth and finally, social justice would decree that there needs to be a fair and efficient distribution of resources among all the people of the earth. Those are my four preconditions. Those are the things that I think we have to be working on. So Ashok, so, Ashok, does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Yes. But, uh, could we be a bit more specific for students of quaternary geology? Uh, these are overarching big, big programs, what you mentioned. Could we be a bit more specific about quaternary geology students? Let's suppose you know, we were to excite newer students who are coming into this game. Yes. What would be the excitements we could bring? I, mean, I could uh, give some, but uh, I would like your wisdom, which is much more than ever. So, anybody else? So, how do I, how, how do I, how do we excite or what kind of, you know, programs should be initiated in a country like India, for example? Yes. I mean, what could be the dry land research paradigms for India? To be more specific, geology point. Well, I begin with rivers, and most of the 
They studied archaeology in India associated with river valleys, going right back to early Stonehenge time. What we need now is to develop and apply a whole new battery of techniques based on geology, on chemistry, on geochronology and dating, geomorphology, paleoecology, to analyze key sites in great detail and begin to understand how human societies in the past have adapted and responded to environmental change, because we're undoubtedly facing environmental change today. And in, in, in a very real sense, the past is the only real guide to the future. If we don't understand what happened, we'll never be in a position to extrapolate, what's, to extrapolate, to extrapolate what's, what's likely to happen in the future. So I think we need to emphasize that uh, human survival, human well-being, studies of quaternary geoscience. I realize that's a very general but How do rivers respond to climate change? Why do rivers sometimes cut down? Why do they sometimes deposit? Does a great river like the Nile, the rivers of India, when it, it during a time of prolonged drought, how does that affect the flow? Does the are the effects felt in the downstream reaches first and then the upstream reaches? Is it a time transgressive response? And how does the archaeological evidence indicate that humans responded? So I don't think you can separate humans from environment. They they interact, always have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I think that was a wonderful one hour journey of the Sahara Desert and you know so many questions and so much of interaction. Thank you, Martin, for being in this platform. We are really, you know, it's the first talk of this legend series. Legends talk series and uh, just a mail to you and you said yes so we were really really uh, you know happy and uh, yeah very yeah what to say I really have I had lots of words but uh, we have to um, we are coming to a, the end of the program and uh, I'm so sorry for the technical issues in the beginning you know while introducing you but everybody knows you so well in this platform and you know um, worldwide. So with this uh, few words and thank you from everybody here and I would uh, request Santosh who was, is our treasurer, uh, the treasurer of AOQR to just propose a, a vote of thanks. Thank you Dr. Vinita Satya. Uh, so on behalf of President Dr. Banda Prasad, AOQR, um, Vice President AOQR Dr. Pradeep Srivastava, Secretary of AOQR Dr. Vinita Satya stays with us here. And on my own, I thank Professor Martin for accepting our request to present uh, exciting talk on the when the Sahara was green. So the talk itself shows how much you are fascinated with this the uh, desert landscape and uh, Saharan environment. You have uh, presented in a very lucid manner how the different cycles of the like climate cycles and the um, climatic fluctuation in the past uh, uh, helps to control or uh, limit the environment to control the environment of the Saharan de desert and when it was green and how the environment changes. So it was really a very interesting talk and I think uh, everyone got benefited with your talk. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank Professor Singhvi, Professor Alice Chamiel, Professor Biswas S. Kale, uh, our Bob Watson, and uh, Professor DM Banerjee, we are all, uh, who are always with us to support the AOQR with their suggestions, views, and help. And uh, I would li also like to thank all the um, audience who are presented here in online platform for attending um, our talk. We are also like to thank ECR uh, of our AOQR uh, who are 
there to help in different manner in a ground level and they always support us in different ways and um, uh, we'd also like to thank uh, computer section of the Birbasan Institute of Paleo Sciences because they are involved in uh, streaming the YouTube session and managing all these uh, technical details of the computer related problems and uh, moreover uh, in, uh, in our next legend talk that will be most probably on 20th February we are going to listen another legends of the quaternary environment. And uh, in this platform, I would also like to uh, inform one uh, news, uh, not a news, actually uh, most of us, uh, most of you become members in the AOQR. But if, uh, I would like to inform that if your name is not visible in, the, in our website, that is www.aoqr.org, kindly inform us in, by writing email, email, email that is AOQR, 2019 at gmail.com so that we can help you why your name is not displaying in the list. So it is a request to all of you in this online platform. And uh, I thank you once again, Professor Martin, for your very lucid talk on this Sahara Desert. Thank you very much and Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So we call this the end of this meeting and we meet maybe on the 28th or the 29th for a uh, talk by uh, Professor Victor Baker. He has he's agreed to it, but you know, the timings between the US and India, you know, we haven't uh, come to a convenient time, but it would be on the 28th or the 29th of this month. So I, it would be nice to meet in this platform again. Thank you all. And, uh, yeah, goodbye. Namaste from Namaste. India. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And I'm happy to field questions by email. So that's it.